Hi, I'm Rich Sportsman with Vinmetrica. Today we're going to go through the new residual reducing sugar test from Vinmetrica. The residual reducing sugar test relies on what's known as the Reveline method in which we are going to react the sugars that are in the wine sample with copper under alkaline conditions and we're going to then do a titration to determine the amount of copper that was consumed and that will allow us to calculate the final concentration of the sugar in the sample. So in running the residual reducing sugar test, the first step is to prepare the samples. If you have wine, uh, beer, or cider, uh, or any substance that you want to analyze sugar for, the first thing to do is to make sure the sample is ready for analysis. If, uh, so if the sample has any uh, uh, significant precipitates or solids in it, you want to filter that out or let it settle or decant it. If you have a red wine, you're going to want to decolorize the wine by any method that you normally use. We're going to show you here how to decolorize it using the uh, clarifying powder that we provide in the kit. So we provide uh, a PVPP based clarifying powder which will decolorize the red wines and make them suitable for the next part of the test. So what I'm going to do is weigh out, well normally we would suggest you weigh out this, but we're going to actually estimate it by volume. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a, a 15 milliliter conical that's provided in your kit and I'm going to fill it to a level of about two and a half milliliters on the uh, uh, little striations here with this white powder. Then we're going to put five mils of wine in there and mix it thoroughly and proceed from there. So here I'm going to fill that sample uh, container with this powder and it's it's kind of fluffy so you want to uh, it, it, it will uh, make a bit of a mess if it falls so and I'm bringing this up to, as you can see, the amount I put in brings it up to about the two and a half mil level. That's all the accuracy you need in order to get this part of the step done. Having done that, I'm now going to take five milliliters of a wine sample that we took. And I'm going to place that in the vial that I just filled with the powder. Okay, there's five milliliters. I'll just put that in there. And you can put the cap on the tube uh, that's provided, and you can sit there and shake it. And we say five minutes, although to be honest, it doesn't really take that long, maybe two or three minutes of sitting here steadily shaking it. And then the next step is to let the either let it settle or centrifuge it or filter it. We have a centrifuge here in our lab, so we're going to use that. But if you don't have a centrifuge, you can just put it in some kind of up, upright position and let it settle for, sometimes it might take about two hours for the whole thing to settle down. Or if you have a filtration set up where you can put it through filter paper, you can filter it off until you get, all you need is two milliliters for this next step. So while we're waiting for our sample to settle or centrifuge, I'm going to go to the next step, which is to prepare the reaction flasks. We're going to pipette in exactly 10 milliliters of this copper sulfate reagent into the reaction flasks that we're using here. Then we're going to add the what we call the binding reagent, which will uh, which creates the alkaline conditions necessary for the uh, step in which the uh, sugars react with the copper to allow us to proceed to the titration. So I'm going to take copper sulfate solution and like many of the reagents in this test the copper sulfate solution is um, corrosive or acidic and so you want to handle it carefully. Notice that I'm wearing gloves and using safety glasses because we don't want anybody to uh, expose their skin or their eyes to a caustic or corrosive reagent. 
Now the step here is to use the 10 milliliter pipette that's provided and as noted in your manual you have to uh, pay a little bit of attention to how you use these. There's a little line here on this that you're going to let your uh, liquid level come down to and when that liquid level comes down to that meniscus as we'll show in a minute you will have exactly 10.0 milliliters in here and it's important to hit that level exactly so that your results will be accurate. So I'm going to go through now and adding this to a couple of, of these flasks because we're going to have at least one flask for our sample and we're going to have one flask for a blank. Every time you run this test you should always run a blank. So we're going to do two here even though we only have one sample. And so I'm going to let that meniscus come down right to that level where the bottom of the meniscus hits that line. You can see I've hit it pretty closely, okay? Now I'm going to dispense that into the flask and what I'm doing is I'm letting the, the tip of the pipette touch the edge of the glass. I don't know if you can see it. Uh, to allow it to drain thoroughly and completely. So we're going to let that run down. And the trick to doing this reproducibly and accurately is to let it run down. And then what I like to do is twist it about five times. Three, four, five. Okay, I did one, and now I'm going to do one more. Again, do not pipette these by mouth. Always use the pipetting bulb that we give you. See how I do it? I pull it up, and I pull the bulb off quickly and put my finger over it there. And control the descent of the meniscus till it's right where I want it. There we go. There we go. Okay. Now, let's go to get our sample that's settled and we'll take it from there. So now that we've settled or centrifuged our wine, um, if you didn't use a filtration idea, then you're going to have to take the supernatant off of the top of the settled precipitate. And so to do that, we suggest you use the little squeeze pipettes that are provided in the kit. And we suggest you put it in a separate tube so that when you actually pipette it, you are less likely... I mean, if you're really good at pipetting, you could probably get that out of there, but you really don't want to disturb the, the uh, uh, settled precipitate because getting it into the sample will cause inaccuracy in the results. So I'm just going to go there and very carefully I'm going to remove all of that material and doing minimal disturbing of the precipitate in the bottom. I'm going to get that whole two milliliters out of there that I need. And I'm going to put it in a fresh tube. Now we have our sample ready. And we're going to prepare the flasks with the binding reagent. Then we're going to add the sample to it. And then we're going to do the heating step, which then gets us ready for the final step of the analysis. So. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take the binding solution, and this is a, an alkaline solution of uh, uh, what they call Rochelle salt, and that tartrate salt has the property of keeping the copper in the right form during this reaction step. So I'm going to take, again, this is a, uh, a pretty caustic reagent, so you don't want to get it on yourself and you don't want to get it in your mouth. So again, I'm going to use a 5 mil pipette and I'm going to put 5 milliliters of this. And this pipetting step is not terribly critical. So as you can see, I'm just going to put it in there. Notice you get the very pretty copper color of the copper binding to the uh, tartrate forming complex. And I'm going to do that in two flasks. And you'll notice that one of these flasks I've written blank on, so I know which one it is. This is going to be my blank. We're going to put in two milliliters of water of the sample in here. And then this is going to be for the prepared wine sample. And we're going to put two milliliters of our prepared wine in here. 
So let's do that. So I rinsed my 5 mil pipette out so it's clean. And I also brought a little distilled water because we're going to use a 2 milliliter sample of water as our blank. And then we're going to put a 2 milliliter sample of the prepared wine in the analysis. So here we go with this. And as we suggest in the manual, to do this with enough accuracy, we suggest you uh, pipette it up to the 3 milliliter mark. There we go. That's going to go in my blank. That's just distilled water. And now in my wine sample, I'm going to shake it out good because all I had in it before was water. And I'm going to take my prepared wine sample that we separated from the precipitate earlier. And of course here I have to be a little careful because I don't have that much oops, <laughs> sample in there. Alright, and again I'm going to let that come down to the 3 milliliter mark by letting off a little bit on the thing and there we go. There's going to be 2 milliliters of wine, okay? So I put 2 milliliters of water in my blank and 2 milliliters of the prepared wine sample in the flask for the sample. I'm going to let that bring out. Just let it drip down. Now, the next step is to heat these samples for exactly two and a half minutes in a boiling water bath and then we'll go on to the final step of the test. Okay, so now we have our samples ready. We've added the water to the blank. We've added the wine sample to the wine. We're going to put these in now for in a uh, um, slowly boiling water bath. It doesn't have to be super fast, but it needs to be at or near boiling temperature. We're going to put them in, and I'm going to start a, a two and a half minute timer here. You want to have this be pretty exact. You don't want to let it go much longer or not long enough because either way you'll increase the inaccuracy of the results. And I always like to give these a little swirl every so often when they're boiling. I'm going to let this go. And what you'll see over the course of the two and a half minutes is that if there's any appreciable sugar in the sample, you'll start seeing a change. Uh, you start seeing a uh, decrease in the amount of the blue color and a little bit of a reddish color appearing. You can already see that happening now in the wine sample. And um, at the end of that time, we'll do our titration, and that will give us the number that we're looking for. Our time is up. Our samples are ready, and we're going to let them sit here and cool for a couple of minutes. And then we'll add the uh, starch and the developer solution, and then we'll do the titration. Okay, so our two flasks have now cooled off enough. Um, they're warm to the touch, but they're ready to go. And we're going to add the uh, RRS developer and the starch, and you'll see it'll turn a distinct blackish, greenish color, and then we'll begin the titration until it turns kind of a lavender, and then finally it'll turn a uh, creamy white color. So we're going to start with a blank, and I already have my burette here filled up to the zero level, so I'm ready to go. So I'm going to add the developer solution. And you can use your pipettes that are in the kit. I usually put a little black mark on the 2 mil mark so it's easier for me to see. And we're going to add 2 milliliters of this. Actually, I forgot there's something else we have to do first. We have to add the acid solution. So, it's better to add the acid first, as the instructions say. So let's do that. So I'm going to take about 10 milliliters, again it doesn't have to be critical, but this is a strong acid solution so don't pipette it by mouth and don't get it on you. I'm going to put that in there and now you can see the reaction goes. If you said that, I'm going to put that right back in there like that. Um, now we're going to add 2 milliliters of starch to that. 
and now you can see it turns that sort of kind of blackish greenish color and now we're immediately going to begin the titration I've checked my zero level I'm ready to go I'm going to start titrating and um, So normally you want to go slowly. Now I happen to know that the blank is going to take about 8 milliliters, so I'm going to let this run in down to about 8. And uh, know the colors become a little more purplish. And if you bring the camera up here, you can see when the drops come into the solution there, that's the color you're going to see at the end point. Okay? And now if I swirl it, the color kind of goes away. And we're going to keep titrating here a little bit at a time. Each time it gets a little lighter in color, I'm going to add a little more. And there's the end point. Okay, so that's the end point color you're going to see, a creamy white color. Okay? That's the blank solution. So now I'm going to read the volume that I got here, and um, if I look closely at that, it comes up to me to be 8.10 milliliters. So I'm going to write that down. 8.10. And since my initial number was zero, that means I used 8.10 milliliters for my blank. Okay, now we're going to do the sample. So again, this doesn't be, have to be critical, but you want it to be close. So there's 10 milliliters. I'm going to put that into the sample. And I'm moving it around a little bit to make sure it rinses everything down. I'll put that back in there because that's fine. And now, again, we're going to add two milliliters of the developer and two milliliters of the start solution. And we're going to titrate this until we get to the same color that we got with our blank. We're starting at 0, 0, so we're good there. We're going to start titrating. Notice that now with each new drop it gets a little bit, a little bit more color. Here you can see we're very close to the end point. We have this sort of light lavender color. We're a drop or two at most away from the end point. So I'm going to try to add one drop at a time. That's just about there, but I'm going to put one more drop in because I can tell it's still got a little lavender color to it. One drop. There we go. I would say that's done. Okay. So now we're going to look at what we got there. And what I'm seeing here is 3.5, 3.60. Okay. So I started at 0. I ended up at 3.60. So my total was 3.60 for my wine sample. So by taking your blank number, and subtracting the number that your wine sample gave you, and then multiplying that difference by the factor 3.6, you'll get the number for your wine in grams per liter of residual sugar. Now bear in mind that that number is uh, reducing sugars and other sugars that might be present, although in most uh, fermented samples they're insignificant, uh, may not uh, uh, be included. For example, if you have sucrose there, which is not a reducing sugar, then you won't see that in your uh, analysis unless you uh, follow the hydrolysis method that's given in the manual for determining sucrose if you know it to be present in, in significant amounts. But it's a pretty simple test. I think you can see you get accurate results 
and they will compare well with results you will get in other places.